man's wisdom. That's what we can break this chapter down into. Man, ever learning, never able to come to the knowledge of truth, why in the world would we think that we could figure it out when you've been wrong so many times? Not anybody ever been wrong? Okay, just checking. Right? Anybody ever been wrong and not want to admit that you're wrong? Just checking. Right? Well, the world is continuously wrong, but yet they think, well, now that we know that we're wrong, we can fix it. Well, if you couldn't foresee that problem, what makes you think that you aren't going to run into another problem down the road that you didn't see coming? The Apostle Paul is saying, avoid those things, shun those things. He says, all that is is a cycle of man saying, you know what, we were wrong, but we're better now than we were before. And then they're wrong. And then what? Oh, well, we've improved. We're better now than we were before. There is no better or worse in God's eyes. There's righteous and unrighteous. The things of God are righteous. They're holy. They are preserved by God because of that. So that what? You can know what God says. You can know what God expects. Without the influence of man's opinions, without the dilution of the doctrines of the Word of God, He preserved it so that you would know exactly what God Himself pinned down for you. Now, He did it for everybody in the world, but He did it just for you. Right? Don't give in to these... I, every time I think of an old wives' tale, this is the one I think of. You can be angry at me if you want to. Popping your knuckles ain't going to give you arthritis. It's an old wives' tale. And he's able to, Brother Jordan, prove it. Okay. There was a doctor who wanted to prove his mother wrong that popping his knuckles wouldn't cause him to get arthritis. Well, he was right handed, so guess what he did? Every day he popped every knuckle on his left hand so many times. And then 50 years later, both knuckles. Sets of knuckles look the exact same. Popping the knuckles didn't give him arthritis. Now, I will prove to you, I mean, now I ask you to prove to me that there is scientific evidence for popping your knuckles going to give you arthritis. Guess what? There isn't any. What are you saying? Some people that had arthritis used to pop their knuckles. That didn't mean that popping their knuckles gave them arthritis. Okay, there are some people... They will never pop their knuckles, but yet they're still going to get arthritis. The two aren't related, but how did it happen one day? One day somebody said, you know what, I'm pretty smart. You used to pop your knuckles all the time. That's what gave you arthritis. You say, well, that's silly, Brother Jordan. No, there's a statement for that. Right? Hang on. Coincidence does not mean causality. Just because the two happened at the same time does not mean that they're linked. Okay, I can go out, order McDonald's, and then go 100 miles an hour down the road off the edge of a cliff. McDonald's did not cause me to die in a car wreck. But yet there are things today taught in churches that claim to believe God and to believe God's Word that are no more than preferences. They're no more than observations. They have no truth to them. They're based solely in man's intellect and man's opinion. And yet people will go home and live off of them because, one, they have a respect for the person that claims to be the shepherd of that flock. The Bible does say to honor your pastor. But the Bible also speaks about in this book what is a true pastor, a bishop that God ordained, and what's an hireling, what's a gainsayer. Right? Fortunately, around here, we've got a true man of God. But... In these verses, he says, there's a whole lot of nonsense out there. He says, in the last days, it's going to get more nonsensy. He says, things that we couldn't even imagine in our day, future generations are going to have to deal with it like it's commonplace. Do you ever have to think that one day you would have to contend with an entire religion that bases the primary benefactor for mankind from God as the mother of Christ I find that Mary did a couple of things in the Bible one before an angel appeared unto her she lived her life according to what God expected she was not defiled she was not openly sinful what was she? she was obedient the Bible teaches that God can only use those that are obedient he will not use someone that is rebellious until they repent of it and become obedient. 
Well, Mary was obedient. You know what I find that Mary was? Mary was blessed. Isn't that what the angel told her? That she was blessed among women. Why? Because she found favor in the eyes of God. There wasn't anything special about Mary other than the fact that God said her. And that's it. Then after Jesus is born, what she do? Well, she does. Raise Christ in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, but he was the Lord, so it didn't take that much effort. Okay, but I do believe that she raised him right. I mean, by the time he was 12, he was already dumbfounding the best scholars of the time. A few times she stepped over the line a little bit. Your father and I were looking for it. Nope, I was about busy about my father's business. She was humbled a few times. Well, if the Lord rebuked her, it means she wasn't perfect. So why in the world would I pray to Mary? But anyway, very few said about the Bible, or said about Mary in the Bible. Very few instances. I do find she had enough common sense, and she had learned over the course of about 30 years that when they went to the marriage feast of Canaan, she said, whatever he says to do, do it. She had no authority. She was a woman at a marriage feast that wasn't for one of her children. And yet, she said, y'all may not listen to me, y'all may not care, I figured this out. Whatever he says, do it. They didn't have to listen to her, but she said it with such conviction that they believed her. You know what? That lady believes what she just said. Let's do whatever he says. What are you saying, Brother Jordan? There's people that make a whole lot out of very little. There's people that go off and invent new doctrines and books of the Bible. They're called, if we were to go back to the Apocrypha, that's an old Latin word that means it's useless and it should be hidden in a drawer out of everybody's sight. Really, that's what the implied implication of the word Apocrypha. But yet they talk today about the Apocrypha. Yeah, throw it back in the drawer you got it out of because it ain't worth well, then why did they translate it as part of the KJV 1611 Bible? Because if they didn't, then all the Catholics and all the bishops and the priests would have rejected that version of the Bible. So what they do on every page, they wrote Apocrypha across it, meaning don't pay attention to this, this is nonsense. That's what they wanted to put in. God put in everything else. People adding to take it away from the Word of God. People taking things out of context and preaching it as if it were doctrine when really it's opinion. People getting up and reading a scripture and then ignoring it for the rest of the time that they're preaching. Right, Y'all have never seen that happen now, have you? Get up, read something. Then by the time they're halfway through their introduction, what's that got to do with anything what we just read? Truth is, it didn't. They tried to find something close enough to what they wanted to preach that they could justify reading that verse. It's ain't happen. But I've seen people get up and say, thus saith the Lord, when God hadn't even darkened the door of the building. Discernment. Another thing that he's talking about in these verses. No one when God said and when God didn't say. Don't you think that's pretty important for you to know as an individual? Pastors shouldn't, be, shouldn't have to tell you when God's moving in the service. You should know just as soon as He does. Because the Holy Ghost is no respect to our persons. If He makes His presence known, everybody in the house that's one of His, His Spirit bears witness with my spirit that He there. You don't have to tell me when the Holy Ghost shows up. I know when He gets there. And there's sometimes that He may be speaking to me, but not openly in the service. What's that mean? Somebody grieving. Somebody's rubbing the wrong way. And because he's a gentleman, he won't force himself on anything. What are you saying, Brother George? But the Apostle Paul's talking about it's going to get crazy, man. Not crazy from the outside. He says, depart from the faith. You know what that means? They should be a part of it. You can't leave something you weren't a part of. People that know the truth, believe the truth, were saved, right? Sealed with the Holy Ghost, go off, and it says, having their conscience is seared like a hot iron. As if they never even retain the fact that they knew something different. They go off chasing what they want to chase. Seen it. I was thinking this week, a whole bunch of people throughout the years join up and say, Preacher, we're with you. A whole bunch of preachers, Brother Ron. 
used to be, I could point out where they used to sit. You may find this hard to believe. I did not always teach this class. I used to be a member of this class. I used to have a teacher. They're not here no more. And the one before him isn't here no more. People that used to be a part, they departed. Why? That's between them and God. I just know that they used to be a part, that they used to teach, that they used to preach, that they used to profess the truth. Why? Because I heard it with my own ears. But yet now they've departed. Some of them made a mess. Some of them stayed in a mess. Others choose to stay in that mess. But he's saying, but lots of people depart for a whole bunch of different reasons. But the Apostle Paul, by the time we get down to verse number 15 and 16, he says, referring to everything in this chapter, meditate upon these things. What's he referring to? In context, he's saying doctrine. Meditate upon doctrine. Find that the Word of God is profitable for doctrine, first thing, for rebuke, reproof, exhortation, teaching. The Word of God can be used to do many great things. But having it preached unto you is only half of the battle. Less than half. The true war is not waged between you and the cushioned pew that you're sitting on on whether or not you can listen for the entire service. The true spiritual warfare of applying the things of God to your life, that comes in meditation. You say, well, Brother Jordan, what is meditation? Meditation does not mean that you sit cross-legged and you hit a bowl and you start going, oh, that's not meditation. That is a form of what the world will call meditation. That is not our biblical definition of meditation. To meditate means to think on. You may have heard the pastor say this, there's a lot to chew on that bone. Right? There's only so much you can do when you get up and there's only so much the Holy Ghost can let you say. And there's only so much that God is willing to reveal to you through preaching because He expects you to get into this book individually and Him reveal things unto you day by day, hour by hour. Meditate upon these things. The Apostle Paul's basically written a very long sermon to Timothy. Y'all get angry if the pastor got up and read something this long to you today during worship service. Now we got six chapters here. All right, well, Brother Doug, normally you only read about five or six verses. Well, today he's reading you all six chapters. Right? It was that letter, but the Apostle Paul knew Timothy's going to read this, but I want him to know, meditate upon this. Go back and reread it. Go back and say, Lord, what am I missing here? Go back and say, Lord, I understand this part, but this part I'm having a little bit of you know, trouble with. I understand this, but I don't get this. For God so loved the world, I get that. But Lord, why on earth would you give your only begotten son for dirty, rotten man? Right? There's a lot of people that struggle with that. You know what the Lord told me? God gave because he loved. If you love, you can't help but give. If you love, giving it in the loss. In fact, you find that by one, he, he received or begot many sons unto God God gave and then God also received he gave because it was what's best for you why because he loved you but brother Jordan I can't understand how God could love me I don't understand how God could love me either but he tells me so much in his word that it's hard not to believe him it gives you time after time and proof after proof of how much He loved you. If you can, re if you wrestling with whether or not God loves you, you got big spiritual problems. Your spirituality is very shallow because God promised that He loved you with an everlasting love before the world was ever formed, before there was ever a heaven, before God ever created anything. He knew you and He loved you. He says, meditate upon these things. You know who's really good at teaching you the Bible? The Holy Ghost. You know who's really bad at teaching you the Bible? Yourself, because your flesh gets in the way. 
How do you know that, Brother Jordan? I'm talking from experience here. You know some of the most eye-opening experiences when it comes to the Word of God for me? You know where it happens? doesn't happen where I'm sitting and, you know, sweating and just trying to read as many verses as I can to try and get something out of it. Nope. That's where I get a verse. God just won't let it get out of my head. And I just start talking to God while I'm driving down the road in the car to work every day, on the way back from work every day, or on the way to lunch, or on the way back from lunch. I just start talking to God saying, Lord, I get this part, but what am I not seeing here? Turn on the lights. You ask God questions, He's going to give you answers. Did He not say, ask, and you shall receive, seek, and you shall find, knock, and it shall be opened unto you? He says, why doesn't that happen? Because you don't believe God's going to answer. That's the only reason God won't. If you really believe God will answer you, when you ask Him a question, you'll be listening for the answer. A lot of people ask, but they never turn back around to listen because they don't believe that God will. Meditation is setting aside time to say, Lord, let's just chew on them things that you've already given me. There's a time for study. There's a time for learning. There's a time for devotions. But there's also a time to say, Lord, there's only so much my little pea brain can handle. I don't have any more room for new stuff because I'm still stuck on the stuff we already talked about. So, Lord, let's just meditate for a bit. Let's digest it. Let's break it down so that I can take that thing that you want me to understand and I can apply it. Because the Word, much like the blood, unless applied, isn't going to give you much good. David said, Thy word have I hid in my heart. You know what that means? He made a place for it that it would be safe. And then he made sure that he put it there. He had to hollow out part of his heart, which the Bible tells us is wicked, deceitful. No man can know it. David said, Lord, we hollowed out a place. I let the Holy Ghost convict me. I let you cut away that part of me that you didn't like. He said, but I hid your word there in its place. You know what hid means? He made it safe. It wasn't going nowhere. If you hide something, it means that once you get done hiding it, Nobody else is going to see anything different outwardly. But inwardly, there's a whole, there's a big change. To meditate upon the things that God has said, Lord, I want to know so much about you that I'm willing to give this up. God didn't ask for it. God didn't command you that it was a sin. could be something that's not even sinful. But just say, Lord, my desire for the things of God are so strong. Let's junk this part of me. And let's hide your word there instead in its place now why did David hide the word of God in his heart that he might not sin against God Lord I'm not hiding your word in me so that I can appear to the brethren as if I have some great intellect or some secret understanding of the word of God there is no more private interpretation there is what God said you know what you're going to get out of the Bible same thing that somebody else got out of the Bible if the Holy Ghost taught it to you the word is spiritually discerned I don't care how smart you are there's a whole lot of people with a whole bunch of letters after their name from you know, seminaries and theological Bible institutes. Guess what? They don't know Jack. You know what they know? What somebody else taught them. You know who did the teaching? Not the Holy Ghost. You know the best place that you're going to find teaching? In meditation. Well, you say, Lord, I know you won't let me get off of this verse. The pastor's been hitting on this for four weeks. And Lord, I don't know what you want me to do with it. You sit down and you just start talking with God. You go over it. You go back and you read that verse. Well, Lord, what's that got to do? He may say, get the context of what's going on in this chapter. You may go back two chapters to get to the beginning of that story in order to get to the point where you understand what's going on in that one verse. Maybe meditating on it. it may just be, Lord, I don't understand what that word means. God's real good. Right, one, hallelujah, God gave us dictionaries. Okay, But two, God's real good at breaking down something you don't understand into something you do understand. How does he do it, Brother Jordan? The only way that he can. Because he'll give it to me. You've heard me say this before. He'll give me what I need to hear out of it, but yet he'll give you what you need to hear out of it so that we both have common understanding of it. You say, well, how can two people learn the same thing two different ways? Happens every day. 
Some people are hands-on learners. Some people are auditory learners. Some people are visual learners. What's the Holy Ghost know? Holy Ghost knows exactly where you are, how you got there, the life experiences that you've had up to this point, where you are spiritually with God, and He knows where He wants you to go, and then He takes a verse, a message, right, a chapter, and He breaks it down and shows you exactly what you need so that you understand it, not the way that I understand it, but the way that God wants you to understand it. You may ask... Me and somebody else explain, you may get two different answers. But they're going to be common. You know what that means? They have the same meaning. Because I'm giving it to you through the lens of my life and my experience. They're going to give it to you from the lens of their life and their experience. But if God applied it, it's going to say the same thing, but different words. The Holy Ghost can take something that... I learned it a completely different way. The pastor learned it a completely different way. Your parents and grandparents may have learned it a completely different way, but God's going to teach it to you so that you understand it just as well as they did. Meditating is taking the time to let God do that teaching. But he says, verse number 15, meditate upon these things. Give thyself wholly to them. Don't know about you. If you want to know something, the way that my brain is worded. If I have a question, if I really want to know, nothing's going to stop me from finding out. I'm not going to do other things until I figure out what I'm curious about. But I am very much ADD. If I see a squirrel, I'm going to chase it till I get it. But sometimes I look at the squirrel and say, mm, I don't want that squirrel. But if I decide I want that squirrel, I'm going after it. Right? That's just how I am. And once I get a scent of something, I'm not going to eat, not going to sleep, till I at least figure out where it went and where I can go see it again, right, to run it down and catch it. We're making progress. It's just the way my brain works. But you also, if you're curious about something, hell or high water isn't going to keep you from figuring out what it is or finding out where you can learn more about it or finding out where you can go to have greater understanding about it. If you've got a hankering for chocolate, until chocolate comes, you're not going to be satisfied. You're going to keep looking for chocolate. But he's saying, Brother Jordan, he says, give thyself wholly to these things. When it comes to application of the Word of God, until you give yourself wholly to God so that He can apply the Word of God to your life, you are not holy God. You have retained part of yourself and you said, Lord, you can cut away any part of me except this. You know what that sounds like to me? Not wholly given over to God. Isn't the Apostle Paul right that, brethren, I beseech you therefore that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God. Either we are wholly accepted by God or we are wholly unacceptable. We've already said there's either holiness or unholiness. There's only righteousness and unrighteousness. There's no shades of gray. But when we meditate upon the things of God and God says, hey, I want to tell you, but we got to, you know, cut this out of the day. Now, Lord, I want that more than I want to know about the Word of God. You're not holy God. Lord, I just don't have the time today. I don't feel like it today. You're not holy God. And I'll remind you that the Apostle Paul said it was your reasonable service to present yourself as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God. Why is it reasonable? Because Christ gave himself wholly for you, poured himself out wholly for you. He doesn't ask you to die for him. He doesn't ask you to be put onto the fires as a sacrifice. But he says, present yourselves a living sacrifice. Something that's alive can't be dead. A living sacrifice is one that goes out and does, lives. He's just saying, wholly give yourself to what God wants you to be. He don't want you to die. He don't want you to pour out yourself. He wants you to be filled with Him and then go out and shine to the world to show them what change God has done in you. How do you say that, Brother Jordan? Because he says, Give thyself wholly to these, them, these things, that thy profiting may appear to all. 
You know why God adds to you? To make you more profitable. God does not take you, save you, and leave you where He found you because that's not profitable. It's not profitable to go out, Brother Charlie, buy a classic car, put all new engine, all new drivetrain, all new brake lines. You can update them nowadays, even disc brakes. That does you no good if you don't change out the ignition. The car ain't going to run. It's not going to move from where it's sitting. Let's put new tires on it. Right? Until you put fuel in the gas tank, it doesn't matter how much you fix up the outside, it's still stuck wherever it is that you found it. Often God deals with those things that the world would say, no, we'll do those things last. No, God gets in deep. What are you saying? You know if somebody's... You, well, you may not know. But if you get a car that's got a V8 engine and a V6 engine and tell them to race each other, you can tell by the sound when they drive by which one's got more horsepower. I don't need to crack the engine. I don't need to take the head gasket off and count how many cylinders are in it. I don't need to take it into the shop and pull the transmission out to see if it's front or rear wheel drive. What he's saying, Brother George, some things you can just tell. Never have to dig into it. Don't have to get on the inside. You can just tell from the outside. Well, he says, Giving thyself wholly to them, that thy profiting may appear unto all. So many times, whatever God has done on the inside, the carnal part of us tries so hard to keep it concealed on the outside. It throws on clothing that identifies with the world. It throws on mannerisms and speech and habits and tendencies that the world looks at and says, hey, that's just like us. But man's going to look at you, and when they see you, guess what they're going to see? Another man. That, nobody in here has reached ascension. Nobody's got halos. We all still outwardly have a lot in common with the world. But when he says that thy profiting may appear unto all, in order to appear, that means at some point it had to be out of sight. When he says thy profiting appears unto you may look on the outside and just see an old beat up car. But when the engine kicks on, you may say, ooh, that don't sound like old and beat up. That engine sounds like it's purring. Like it's got a little bit of oomph left in it. You know what, now that we look at the tires, those aren't old tires. They're not cracked on the wall. Right? They don't, they're not balled all the way down, no tread. No, them's racing tires. Right? The outside of this looks like us, but it don't sound like us. It doesn't take off like us. It doesn't handle the way that we handle. It doesn't drive the places that we drive. God's focused on the inside, not the outside. Do you think it's any wonder that God would outwardly let us remain as a human, okay, in this flesh, when He said that He uses base things to confound the wise? If you looked like Superman, nobody would think it was special that you were doing things like Superman. Right? If God turned you into, right, some super strong guy people wouldn't be you know shocked when you lifted more weights than Arnold Schwarzenegger used to that's why Samson was such a shock to the Philistines because he's a little tiny scrawny dude right God used the weakling to go out and whoop dudes that had been lifting and warring and carrying about with shields and spears and swords their entire life God uses the base things that can found the wise Outwardly, we don't look like much, but when you wholly give yourself over to the things of God, those things He's put inside, they start making a lot of noise on the outside. And thy profiting or thy growth, thy maturing in the things of God is known among all. All that are around you. Because if you light a candle in a dark room, everybody's going to know that it's in that room. If you sound a horn in an open street, 
Everybody within earshot is going to be able to hear it. God did not give us those things inwardly to hide them and be ashamed of them. He gave them to us to use them. Then verse number 16 says, Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Now see, spiritually, take heed unto doctrine. We, that makes sense to us. Yeah, listen to doctrine. Take heed. Pay attention to it. Take notes. Right? Apply that to yourself. But before he ever gets to doctrine, he says, take heed unto thyself. Now, what's that mean, Brother Jordan? But to take, obviously, means to lay hold on, to grab. You've got control over it. You may put your hand on something, but until you take it, you don't have control over it. But he says, take heed. Heed means to pay attention. Heed means that you have understanding of it. You can't pay attention to something that you don't know anything about. Sit down and try to explain to a second grader what you know string theory and physics is about. Good luck. They can't take heed to that because they haven't learned everything in the middle to have understanding of it. You could throw it at them, but they don't have the capability to grab onto it, to retain it. But it says, take heed unto thyself. In so few words, what the Apostle Paul is saying is, first off, if you're not already, gain humility. You cannot take the things that God wants you to apply to your life, that God wants you to understand, you cannot wrap your mind around them if you first do not know what you already are. Now, I know that we're kings and priests. I know that once you're saved, you would join there with Jesus. Right? But that's taking heed unto my position. Right? When he saved me, my conversation's already recorded in heaven. I'm already seated in heavenly places. Everything's there just waiting on me to shed this body and meet up with the rest of it. But see, that's my position. He's talking about take heed unto thyself. Talking about our preparations. Nothing can ever separate me from the love of God. We can go through the list of everything. Nothing can ever separate me from the seal that He placed upon me the day that He saved me. I can't lose my salvation. Nothing can change my status with God other than me. You say, you believe you can lose yourself? No. We're talking about the will of God. That's my position. He gave it to me when He saved me. But down here, that's practical. That's living. I understand that there's a distance between here and there and that in the meantime, I ought to be busy about the Father's business. Well, in order to do that, first I got to know what I am. You know what I am? Not much. If you start taking heed unto yourself, you're going to find out everything that you thought isn't as important as what you believed it to be at the beginning. Take heed unto thyself. Really... Start making a list of things that you can do and things that you can't do without God. You're going to find out you can't do anything without Him. Make a list of the things that the arm of flesh is capable of accomplishing for you. You're going to find nothing. Outside of the grace of God, you're not able to stand up and even understand who you are. Have knowledge of your own being. So when he says, take heed unto thyself, God did say, though, that he gave unto every man certain spiritual gifts. Some people are interceders. Some people know how to pray at the horns of the altar in supplication for others. Some people are prayer warriors. Some men he calls to preach. Some he calls to pastor. Some he calls to missions. Some he calls to be a godly father that raises his family in the nurture and admonition of the Lord and instructs them in the ways of righteousness. Not for the Father's namesake, but for our Heavenly Father's namesake. 
Some he calls to be doers. What do you say about doers? He calls everybody to go do something. But some people just got a knack for making things happen. Right, they're like Brother Ray. You can give him a golf ball, a screwdriver, a bent up paper clip, and some duct tape, and he can fix something. Right, he's better than MacGyver because he's real. But right, God does give unto everyone spiritual gifts. There are things that God has given to you that nobody else in the church can do. You know why I firmly believe that? Because he said we were fitly framed together. That means that he made a place that only you could fill. And if only you could fill it, that means that you've got something to add that nobody else does. Because God said the church wasn't complete without you as a part of it. That tells me that God thinks very highly of you that he would want you to have a specific position called out. Where only you can fill those curves of that piece of the puzzle to where the picture is finally framed, right, or complete. But until you take heed unto thyself, you're not going to know what spiritual gifts God's given you because you're not interested in using them. You're not interested in them and maturing them and developing them, furthering them. If God gave you the ability to play an instrument, hallelujah. But just because you know three songs doesn't mean that God doesn't want you to know four. That just because you know how to play it last week doesn't mean that you don't need to practice it this week. But we are human. We forget. We have a tendency to revert to the last thing that we did. Anybody ever get up, go to sing a song, and then all of a sudden you're trying to sing a verse from a different song that doesn't go with this one? Because you practiced that one last, and that's what's stuck in your head. You say, Brother Jordan, why is that happen? Because we're human. But if God's given you a gift, you ought to sharpen it. You ought to hone it. You ought to ask God to make you the best at what He's called you to do that you can be. And if you're like me, you're going to ask Him not just to be the best that you can be, but the best that He can make you. Not for my name's sake, but because I want to be used greatly for His name's sake. He did a lot for me. I want to do a lot for Him. That's not selfish. That's sacrificial. Lord, you gave so much for me, let me give for you. Let me be profitable unto you. Let my profitability be known among others so that they know God can take them and make them into something profitable. Then he goes on to say, and under the doctrine. Not enough to know who you are. You got to know what God expects you to be. You got to know who God is. You've got to understand what God can do for you before you will ever understand that you need God to do it. You didn't know that you needed a Savior until God convinced you he is lost. You're not going to ask God to mature you as a Christian until you realize how immature we really are. Until you understand how little it is that we've really wrapped our head around. He says, continue in them. I don't see a time frame on that. This says continue. Till when Jesus comes? Continue. Until when? Till God says stop. Well, when's that going to be, Brother Jordan, when you get I already said God's no respecter of person. We all got the same finish line. You know what it is? Heaven. But how long is that going to be? It might be different for you than it is for me. All I know is, is that we're going to reach it one day and then that's when we get to stop. There's no I've learned enough there's no that well, I've already heard that preached before well you may have heard that section preached before you may not have heard what he's getting ready to preach preached before you know how many different ways I've heard same passages of scripture preached over here why because it's new every day God breathes a new life on it and all of a sudden there's something there that wasn't there the day before it's there you just weren't ready to see it yet but he says, for in doing this, thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. The Apostle Paul saying that Timothy, if he lives a righteous and holy enough life, if he yields himself unto God, that Timothy's going to be able to save people? No. He's not talking about spiritual salvation. 
He's talking about saving people after they get saved. Saving them from what? Heartache. Saving them from headaches. Saving them from potholes that Timothy's already driven over. Or things that God has said, hey, don't go over there. There's problems over there. When Timothy gets up and he preaches, hey, God says there's problems over there. I'm not going over there. You don't go over there because God said there's problems. He said stick to this path. If people listen, guess what he's doing? He's saving them from the heartaches and the hardships and the problems that are over there. Who saves a person spiritually? Christ. But when it comes practically, how many of us can raise our hand and say that the pastor was burdened by the Holy Ghost to preach a message that saved us a whole lot of trouble? A time or two. Or many times. Or how many of us can say that the pastor preached on something that we had been praying and asking God for an answer about, and all of a sudden he reads his, you know, text and all of a sudden something jumped off the page and our hearts doing backflips in the middle of the pew some of y'all liable to act like Brother Phil maybe one day and take a lap why because God did something for you specifically for what purpose to either save you from heartache to heal you from heartache but he addressed something in your life that was causing you trouble and now it's not causing you trouble anymore we know that the pastor didn't do that. It was the obedience and being used of God that allowed it to be so. But God took an instrument and He helped you with it. That's all we are. We're instruments. We're just tools. But isn't it good to know that when God grabs a hold of you, when you yield, when you've given yourself wholly over to Him, when you've been meditating upon the things you got, you're sharp, you're ready to be used, and when he goes to use you, you know that you're going to make a difference in somebody's life. You may never see it. You may not know this side of glory, all that God's used you as a tool to do. But you do have faith that because he's using you, he wants to do something. And because you're not trusting in yourself to do it, I know he does all things well. If I was trusting in my strength to do it, that person wouldn't get no help. But if I trust Him in His time and in His method to work things out, it's going to look beautiful on the other side. Because everything that He touches is lovely. If God's paying specific attention to it, you know what that means? God is specifically planning to do something in that person's life. And if God's got a plan, God's will is going to be done whether I like it or not. I might as well just hop on a train and enjoy the ride. Did you know that you could receive a daily devotion every morning in your inbox? Head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on Daily Devotions to sign up today. And as always, thanks for listening.